Hey guys, it's SD, your host of the Life Fix Relationship Podcast, where people with all sorts of backgrounds, challenges, and life experience show us how they make their relationship extraordinary. Hey guys, we're here today with Dr. Jessica Higgins, a licensed psychologist and relationship coach for over 20 years. She runs relationship workshops and courses, authors a blog, and is also the host of the Empowered Relationship Podcast. Hey, Jessica, I'm so glad you're here with us today. How are you doing? I am doing really well. I'm happy to be spending this time with you. Me too. You want to tell us what is shifting out of criticism? What does that mean and what does that do to a person? Yeah, so particularly in relationship, this is a really common thing that we resort to in making an observation or even giving what feels like constructive feedback to our significant other. And on the receiving end, I mean, that's in its lighter form and there's a spectrum around it can get kind of brutal and you know, when we're in those escalated places, it can even probably be name calling or really calling someone out in a not so nice way. And regardless of what, if it's on the lower end or the higher end, it typically isn't something that people respond really well to. And so it's a major complaint. And not only that, it also is one of the things that tears couples apart and is probably one of the leading causes of separation, breakup, and divorce. So it's as small and subtle as it might sound as criticism, it can have a really big impact on the dynamic. So I know that you had your own personal experience with it. You want to tell us a bit about it and where you came to this realization? I have have had a relationship fall apart and I didn't know. I think part of just to answer your question, sometimes it's awareness, like so many other transformational processes, just even the recognition that perhaps what is happening and what's getting us stuck is often really helpful to just try to bring that consciousness to the situation. And in this previous relationship, I was aware that he was really hypercritical and I was doing my best to respond to the content of what he was saying. So he was like, you this or this and that. And I was responding to the thing he was saying. And literally we would spend hours I'm not exaggerating hours of trying to hash it out because I, in my vantage point, then I thought if he would only understand, then we would clear up the misunderstanding and there would be no issue, right? That was how I was approaching it. But everything I said only seemed to make it worse or never really helped. And so we would spin in circles and then we had reached out for support and just really struggled. And it wasn't until years later that I recognized I was actually teaching a workshop and I was leading this experiential exercise and I was using criticism as the kind of attack, if you will. And I was saying, oftentimes this is about them and this is what kind of, it's all the stuff that's bringing, you know, that they're challenged with or perhaps where they're triggered. And this is kind of the protest or the, what it looks like on surface level, but there's more going on. And at, in this workshop, I said, it's likely that he was scared or that this person's scared. And I had this like kinesthetic awareness of like, oh, he was scared and he was trying to feel some level of safety or trying to criticize to get some level of control over his feelings. And I didn't know that. So what happened after that? Well, it's been a progression. I wrote a few articles talking about critical tendencies and where we typically get that and signs that possibly you are critical and then how to kind of manage that. And I got so much interest and so many people reaching out to get support around criticism. And so it's been, I would say, maybe seven years of kind of just this developing of serving people. And then I had done a training with Dr. Susan Johnson um, years ago, and I was recognizing how criticism is the protest, right? It's a way to try to indicate to your partner, hey, I'm not okay. This doesn't work for me. I don't like this. But that's just the beginning point. And most of us 
don't have access to those deeper layers. And so when we're protesting, our partner's going to respond to that protest. It's almost like a secondary emotion because secondary emotions typically push people away. So anger, even some anxiety sometimes, or again, the criticism, or again, the all the things that we do when we're not happy, those tend to push people away. But if we can get in touch with like, hey, I got scared, or we're still building our relationship and I realize how much I am starting to care about you and it freaks me out and I want to feel more safe and like, I want to talk about that. Like that's something on a primary level people, it brings them close because then their partner can hear that request and usually leans in. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so many times when our partner's criticizing, it's really coming from a place of fear of not being able to express themselves, scared of something else is going to happen. Yeah. Over the last, I'd say 10 years and really working with people specifically on this, there's a lot of people who get a lot of value in being in their intellect and reasoning and possibly even for their career. It's something that is a huge strength of theirs. And then if we look at their upbringing, it's likely that they were raised in an environment where criticism occurred often. So it was modeled to them. And that emotional attunement and that real validation and that that child's experience is seen and heard and held and there's safety for that. So when they don't have that, they learn to kind of contain those emotions, keep it like keep it separate and lead with the intellect because it's safer. And so we kind of keep those things suppressed, if you will. And so it informs the criticism, but we're not, we're kind of holding that because again, we haven't had the experience that that's been held safe or attuned to, or that it's mattered. Like I can tell you a client was like, emotions were vulnerable. They were like a, they were a bad thing and it made, and they were seen as that's your week and that you were going to get eaten alive out in the world and even in the family. So it was something that she learned to not really lead with and it makes sense or be transparent about. Yeah. Yeah. So how does one shift out of criticism into loving, understanding and connecting with their partner? It's a process for sure. And one of the things that um, I give people on the starting point is just, again, that recognition and that awareness. So I have a guide that shows people what we typically say, like, I'm so tired of you leaving your shoes in the middle of the walkway, right? That's addressing the complaint. The person's likely going to be like, ah, and then again, want to get defensive. So one of the things is to, again, recognize that's not getting our need met, right? Our partner's not really responding well. So if we can have the awareness that that's not working, oftentimes people need a little support and and space to unpack this, but get in touch with like, I want to be able to walk through the walkway and in the at night or when I've got things in my hands and I can't see the floor, I'm afraid I'm going to trip or I have tripped and it is hard. That, or even I just want it to be clean. Yeah. Or I want it to be clean. Then there's a sense of, it usually has meaning. And when the partner can hear, oh, you want to walk freely without the trip hazard and, oh, you have tripped and you hurt your ankle or something like, I care and I want to help versus the former is like, you suck. Here's why you suck. And here's why you're you're doing wrong. And the person's like, that's only one time in one week. Like, you know, that's not a big deal. And what's your problem? And so they're off and running and disconnect. But if somebody can connect with what's the deeper request, then that usually lends to a partner being able to receive that a little more. So I, the first level would be perhaps even using that guide to see the contrast of what some of these things look like without a lot of um, exploration or inquiry. It's just our knee-jerk reaction because that's usually what it is. It's a reaction. I don't like something and I'm looking at it externally and I can target it and I'm going to speak to it. But if we slow down and we can recognize, oh, there's meaning there for me and what is that and can I reveal that? So there's a process of uncovering and connecting with that and then the transparency to be able to reveal that to a partner. Yeah. So that sounds all nice and beautiful, ideally, but it's really hard Mm -hmm. to implement. Mm -hmm. What is something to start with today? I want to start being more understanding and connecting with my partner, not just yelling at them every time 
they do something that I don't like, what's the first thing you'd suggest? What I see a lot of people attempt to do is I'm going to willpower myself. Like I'm just going to stop it. I'm going to vow to not do this. And I'm going to focus on gratitude and I'm going to focus on all the beautiful things that I love about them. And that gets you a certain length down the road, but it's typically not sustainable. So one of the things that I would invite people listening, if they recognize that sometimes they are critical, and I will say that there's oftentimes, I mean, I see both men and women being critical, but what I find too is sometimes when women in a heterosexual relationship are having a difficult time accessing their partner, they'll get a little louder or they'll get a little stronger in their requests. And it can often sound potentially harsh. And I think women stereotypically, again, had a little more time to investigate their emotional world. There's a little more support culturally, typically. So it's a little more accessible. And so they can be pretty quick in their analyzing the emotion, analyzing the situation. And then they're like, blasting their partner and their partner's just like, ah. And so again, to answer your question, I think for listeners who maybe recognize some of these patterns is to just possibly slow down and consider, and I know you're saying this is difficult and it is, that's why there's people like me and people like you and people around the world that are supporting people to develop new skills. But I would suggest that getting in contact with what is the request. So John Gottman, who's a prominent researcher in the field of couples and relationship. He talks about within every criticism, there's a unmet need. And so if we can tune into, because most of the time we don't want to rock the boat. Like if things are going well, we're like, great, I want to ride this wave and this feels good. And I'm not going to like bring up an issue I have. However, if we have something that's gnawing at us or is bothering us, it has this cumulative effect. And then when something happens, then it's like we have all this stored up angst and then we're likely to deliver it with much more power and it's hard to receive. So in what I'm saying, I guess I want to just reiterate that there's an important need that we can't bypass or we can't overlook and we really need to have space for that. And so for somebody that's lived their life in the intellect and is like, I don't even tune into my emotions, I think it would be just building some emotional awareness and emotional maybe intelligence, if you will, around kind of taking a temperature read around how am I, what, what are my needs? And just getting to know that a little bit, building that awareness. Yeah. First step like to everything is to be aware. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who wants to have an extraordinary relationship? I mean, there's two things that I would say, I know you're asking for a number one, but I feel like it's a really two pronged approach because as we are developing our intimacy and that there's a horizontal, if you will, line of development, so the theory around growing the relationship, right? The relationship has this development. Then you have two individuals that also have their individual development. And so at any given moment, we have the space between us and the relationship that we're co-creating. And we also have our individual self to be attentive to. And so for an extraordinary relationship, research and theory really supports showing up for the relationship and all the things that that requires, but also the development of ourselves. So, so often I think people are particularly, we get a lot of messages in media around giving to the relationship. Men do this, women do this, they do it differently. Men don't always bring their needs. They're just like, I'm listening and I'm tracking you and how can I show up for you? And, you know, women do a lot of nurturing stereotypically again, but there's a lot of ways that they give to the relationship. But if we're not attending to our needs as an individual, again, likely we're going to be triggered or reacting, feel insecure, feel threatened. And then the way that we deal with that is the biggest game changer because I really invite people to look at when we feel triggered or we feel some level of upset, that that's actually information and curriculum for our development. So it's an inner game and then it's a relational game. And so for a remarkable relationship, we can't bypass our individual growing edges, our learning, our healing. And as we do that, we are able to be that much more available 
and present to relationship. Yeah. And it goes back to what you're saying about criticism is realizing that there's something more there, that there's a need that's not being met and taking yeah. care of that. Yeah. Cause I mean, look, there's so many magazines and so many tips and tools around how to do relationship well and sex well. And, you know, these are all really good strategies, but if they're not connected, it, right, we can walk the walk without really having it be integrated to what's most meaningful to us. And we can show up and run those, run those strategies, but it's not going to have the type of change that people really want because it's not connected and representing and authentic in those deeper ways. Yeah. Yeah. If someone wants to take their connection to a deeper level, what would you suggest them to do? Well, I think I'm speaking to it, right? If they're noticing where do they get stuck, what gets in the way of them connecting, then I think there's a deep exploration around what's going on relationally. There's a dance that t- people are in in relationship. What moves do I make? What moves do they make? And that's worth giving some attention to. There's also like, where do I go? So let's say my partner's late for one person and an- another relationship might be like, sweet, I get to check my email and respond to some texts or listen to this thing where another person would be like, just fuming. Like, how could you? It's so disrespectful. You know, I don't like this. And like, it could be a big deal. So that is ours to look at. So then there's the individual, but then there's a real cultivating of the positive presencing of intimacy. And there's a lot of ways that we can do that. And it's really having that quality space, whether or not it's doing an eye gazing exercise or just being present without a lot of distractions and having deeper conversation, maybe it's sharing a fun activity together and playing together. There's so many things that we can do to nurture that bond. And um, I could go on and on about that. But I think in a nutshell, it's two things in that we're looking at the things that get us stuck. And we're also looking at how to build positive. um, Because I think we get a threshold of what's been pleasurable and we reach a threshold of our comfort zone around how much intimacy and how much passion we can hold. So sometimes we actually Actually do need to put some attention into that. And it's not an easy thing. It can be vulnerable to really open up to more passion and more love. And then looking at where we get stuck, what is disconnecting. Yeah. And it's a thing that happens over time. Yeah. The more months, the more time you do it, the greater and deeper the connection grows. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode and subscribe to the podcast. Leave a comment below so I can know what you think and to book your relationship photo shoot CJ session or just to hear more about what we do, go to lifepicksrelationships.as.me. I'm waiting.